Check, check. Hello. Hello, KCC Comic Con folks. Welcome. We are so glad to have all of you here. This is wonderful to see people in costume, people shopping, people playing video games, trying out the full motion slim. Uh, there's board games up in the library. There's all sorts of activities. But what would a Comic Con be without featured speakers? We have a whole line of speakers today. Up here on the big screen joining us is Peter Tirius. Hello, Peter. Hey, how's it going, everyone? So, Peter, I met at the Medford Comic Con a few years ago, pre-COVID. Peter's had quite an extraordinary career working in films, working in video games, and a published author of multiple books. Great way to kick off our Comic Con. Thank you so much, Peter, for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, to be honest, like I haven't actually done a conference. Uh, I think since before the pandemic. I think it was. It's, so it's been two years. So I'm really excited to be here, and thank you everyone who's uh, here uh, to check it out. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit just about my uh, career, um, and I'll focus a, a bit on my science fiction uh, sort of writing career. And I, if anyone has any questions about anything, I'd love to uh, hear. So uh, let me share my screen. Um, oh, shoot. Sorry. I'm at this. Hey, sorry, Peter. You're, you're coming in a little bit softer. We're going to try to boost the volume a, a okay. little. Okay. <coughs> so there are projects that Peter has worked on, but there's this little thing in LA called NDAs, non disclosure agreements. Uh, so there's some things that we can acknowledge that he's worked on, but we can't actually go into detail about the project. But just so you know, uh, some of the films uh, that, that I can think of off the top of my head, he's worked on a Men in Black film. He's worked on uh, Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. Um, he's worked on multiple video games. In fact, he's currently writing a video game that we can't talk about. <laughs> uh, and he's the author of several books. You know what? Uh, let, let's let's see if we, we can get the volume uh, up a, a, a little bit. Uh, can you hear me better now? Can Can you hear him better now? Yes. Great. Okay. Yeah. No. So, um, like Kurt was saying, yeah, I, I've worked in animation. I've worked in film. Um, uh, most recently, about a year ago, I was at Pixar, so I was working on animated uh, films and. I've really enjoyed the culture, just being around all the people and working on just these extraordinary films and being around so many talented people. And obviously, it's very inspiring because you're around some of the most brilliant people uh, in the world. And so then that kind of, you know, hopefully rubs off on me. And so I'm always trying to push myself as an artist, as a storyteller and as a writer. And so um, for me, like I, I really enjoy working on the films, but I also really enjoy the personal projects that get inspired. It, during that time. And so for me, one of my main books um, uh, is the Mecha Samurai Empire series, uh, which I'll dive into. Uh, but way before that, like when I was a kid, uh, this was from when I was like six or seven. This was me just writing stories in my notebook, uh, having like silly drawings. You can see it's just my terrible handwriting. Uh, but just, you know, trying to tell stories, combining science fiction and fantasy and mythology and just kind of whatever came to mind as a kid. Uh, and another thing that really inspired me was video game manuals. Like I, I love video games, but also I just love pouring over the manuals. So Legend of Zelda was one that really stood out for me uh, just because of the drawings and how mystical it felt and how grand. And so it gave me a sense of wanting to, to explore and to figure out more about the world. Uh, and on that note, Ultima is another one. So I love the map. And one thing that I loved about Ultima, even back then, was that a lot of the quest wasn't so much about defeating some evil, but it was about be becoming a good person, becoming an avatar. And just like the way you could approach your different, the different types of quests, uh, I found really inspiring. And so when I grew older, I was like, what do I want to be? I really wanted to write video game manuals. And so one of the first things that I got to do as a writer was write video game manuals at LucasArts. Uh, so Jedi Starfighter, Starfighter, again, those were really fun. 
I, I think we actually have Jedi Starfighter available for people to play over in Building 7 right now. Wow, awesome. Okay. Yeah, like I, it's funny because like the manual process, you just have to play the game a lot and then, you know, uh, work with the level designers and the programmers, you know, just to get everything down, uh, working with the editor and stuff like that. So it's, it's, it's a lot of work. Uh, um, and I really appreciated uh, how much it t taught me about the game, but also just working within that structure and working with the team. And it was also just a dream come true, right? Um, and from there, uh, my career, I started writing a lot more short stories. And so I started getting published in literary magazines. Uh, and th that was really cool for me because every single story, like uh, you can just put down a lot of words, but like, how do you structure it? Um, and a lot of short stories that people want these really good stories within two to 3,000 words. So how do you tell, how do you have a story arc? How do you convey character? How do you convey themes within that short space? And so that was a really good education for me and a really good exercise for me to grow as a writer. And my first actual book was a collection of short stories called Watering Heaven. Um, and from there, what was cool was uh, the, the collection of short stories opened a lot of doors for me because it, it happened to uh, get some really good reviews. And uh, it connected me with an editor who published my first novel, which was called Bald New World. And it's, it's like a dystopian novel where everyone in the world loses their hair. Uh, so it just kind of gave me a chance to explore what would it be like if literally everyone woke up and all their hair was gone. Uh, and like, you know, th then like wig companies kind of are, are really big conglomerates. And like, you know, the different types of tattoos become really fashionable and stuff like that. And so it, this was a really good first step for me. And then from there, like what was cool was uh, Ball New World was uh, won a bunch of awards and it was considered one of the best books of summer 2014 by Publishers Weekly. Uh, and so and the other funny thing was uh, at the time I was uh, uh, dog sitting for a friend and like I just snapped this picture and this picture kind of went viral. So that was kind of cool. So I always associate this book with this corgi. Um, and from there, I, I continued like just growing as a writer, uh, writing for video game sites. So one of my favorite sites was Kotaku. So writing about Sweet Home uh, and just anything like, you know, I, I, I'm, I think my specialty and what my passion is trying to find developers uh, of old games and just, you know, trying to interview them and, you know, getting their, uh, the, uh, their stories uh, translated. So like recently I talked to Jun Chikuma, uh, who had done the uh, music for Faxanadu and uh, the Bomberman series. And that was really fascinating just hearing like, her uh, approach to music, which was very different from a lot of the other uh, uh, composers that I'd spoken to. Uh, before that, I spoke to uh, the composer for Fantasy Star 3 and 4. Again, just really fascinating because those games were so powerful for me as a kid. And so just to get into their minds and just to know like what the development process was uh, and like how, like just knowing like how much those stories impacted me and then finding out like how the creation process went, it was, it was like really uh, mind blowing for me. Um, and so for me, then I started wanting to get into like stories of my own. So I thought like, what's, what's meaningful for me. And so when I was growing up, I heard a lot of stories about World War II on the Asian side. And it was very different from what I was hearing. Uh, like there was just so much more that, that had not been covered. And so I wanted to tell a story exploring the Asian side of World War II. And then I started exploring the technology. And like, these are some of the pictures I found. Like this looks like almost like a Mecca. Um, it it again, totally like, does, yeah. Yeah, and this is like a super tank uh, that the Axis side made. And this is like a super huge tank. Uh, again, like this is from the Nazis, you know, like uh, it looks like a, it's like a stealth bomber. Uh, and again, like, so that led to like, what if, you know, I was inspired by Man in the High Castle. What if the Axis side won World War II and they used a bunch of giant robots? Uh, and so that's how United States and Japan came about. Um, and then from there, like I, I really, um, what was awesome was the, the book did really well in Japan. So again, this was another moment where like video games, which had such a big impact on me growing up, uh, then it went full circle and the books were doing really well. So this was like a, a display in Japan. Uh, again, oh, this is me just visiting uh, my publisher for the first time. They did this display for me uh, at the publishing house. And then, uh, and then it, it started spreading. So it got a Czech um, uh, translation, Mandarin, multiple languages uh, and stuff like that. And then what was really cool was it won the Seiyun Award. So this is at the uh, Worldcon a few years back, and they did the Seiyun Award there. So that, that was really awesome for the book. Um, and then uh, one of my other things was me meeting one of my heroes, Hideo Kojima. Uh, so he tweeted about this. Uh, and this was awesome in itself. But then shortly after that, for my second book, Mecha Samurai Empire, he actually blurred it and called it the future of science fiction. So for me, I was just like, wow, like uh, what, a, what a huge, tremendous honor. 
uh, to, you know, get to meet one of my legends and then to have him read my work and then to say it's actually good. Right. So that was pretty exciting for me. Uh, and then like, I got a, a lot of really cool fans who started making like the robots and the toys from the books. Uh, and so like my approach to the, uh, mechas and like the, the way the characters moved was inspired a lot by the films that I worked on. So like a lot of my work was working on characters. And so I'm, I'm creating these puppets for the animators to move. And so I started getting into the technical aspects of how does this machine move? What would I do if I was actually building it for a movie? And then incorporating that into the mecha piloting. So it became like this thing where they were synchronized or there was like synchronicity between my film experience, between my writing experience, and then trying to make it more realistic. Like I know a lot of mecha uh, novels and, and, and manga and anime, they're focused on one hero pilot kind of, you know, saving the day. Whereas if you work on most films, there's usually a team of people who are all working, collaborating together. And so that's what I focused more on with the mecha piloting. Uh, and then again, this is just more fan art. Like, I can't believe, like, this is fan art, right? I, to me, this looks like professional. And I was blown away just by, like, the kind of, just the passion and excitement people had for the IP. Um, uh, this is this is the official, one of the official covers from John Liberto, who did the designs. Uh, and then this is just me. Like, one of my fans sent me the, t the toy that they built. And so I was just, you know, really excited about it. Um, and then more fan art. Uh, and then th this is just me, like, at the Penguin booth uh, for the book. This is from New York Comic Con, actually. So uh, they had this big uh, booth there uh, display with the book. So, yeah, that that's uh, – so th that was really quickly um, just kind of a summary of my background and my uh, past experiences. Um, yeah. Dude, terrific. So um, published author multiple times over with – um, mecha based books, which I know there's a whole culture behind that in Japan. And uh, we got reintroduced to that in this country when Pacific Rim came out. Uh, yeah. Of course, that the huge popularity of that film, I'm sure, helped with book sales. Yeah, definitely. Um, and Pacific Rim is so great. I just the, the storytelling, Guillermo del Toro is amazing. And I just sorry to mention this, but Guillermo del Toro saw some of the cover art and he actually retweeted it, which was kind of a really fanboy moment. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Pacific Rim is just, is, it feels so realistic and there's so much dramatic storytelling. And so like you, you try to convey some of that, um, with the mecha combat, but also I was trying to incorporate a lot of the themes with world war II, what was going on in the society and stuff like that. And also just exploring that past. Cause I think usually when you hear about world war II, it's from like you, the Western perspective. And so I did a lot of research, like what was it like from the Asian perspective and then trying to incorporate that in America. And so I felt like, uh, so a big inspiration was Man in the High Castle. And one of the things that was interesting for me was uh, for Philip K. Dick, um, he, he really wanted to do a sequel, but he found the material really disturbing because obviously he's got to get into the mind of the Axis side. And so for, even for me, when I started doing research, it was very, it was, uh, it, it was hard for me to, it took like a sort of pull. Uh, and so I was trying to find uh, the themes that were important for me uh, and that kind of made it relevant. So that's when I approach my storytelling, I usually try to find the theme rather than like a plot or subject material. And so for me, it was a, a lot about um, like that dystopian society and how do you survive in that dystopian society? How do you maintain a sense of, you know, uh, of integrity and ethics when, you know, basically uh any sense of integrity and ethics is is almost punished in that society again because it's a totalitarian society so again and then the, there are these huge mechas that come on and fight each other and stuff like that so it was a really fun balance uh just trying to find that terrific so that's your book side of things yeah let's talk a little bit about some of the video games and the films that you've gotten to work on and i know with some you can't go into detail yep but let's at least get a background on some of the films and video games that you've been able to be a part of. Yeah, no, um, uh, I think so. Just being general, but I, you know, I was at Pixar for seven years before. Um, uh, amazing studio, like one of the best places I've worked, hands down. Um, just beautiful work. Uh, just really like every day I went, I felt so inspired. Like I just was like amazed by all the people. And the other thing that's amazing about Pixar is how supportive they are. Like, you know, I had this literary career and they're always like, yeah, you know, whatever you need, we totally support you. Um, before that, I was at Sony. Again, like you, you mentioned a few of the films that I worked on, um, Alice in Wonderland, Guardians of the, Ga uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. Um, one little thing about Guardians of the Galaxy that was funny was um, I was, the main thing I was working on was like the, the big ship at the end. 
but there was a character that they gave me and I had no idea who it was. Like I didn't even think, and it was like this duck. And so I did the basic rigging and I, I didn't even think about it. And then later everyone was saying, Oh, Guardians of the Galaxy has a special cameo with Howard the Duck. And I was like, Oh, that's so cool. And then I clicked the link and I realized, oh my goodness, that's the character I worked on, but I hadn't even known that, right? I because th- it was very secretive. And so I was like, oh wow, like that was just a hilarious moment for me. Um, but yeah, just they, it, every single moment, like just working on these really cool characters and just the challenges that come with each new character was really fascinating for me. So like in Men in Black 3, I really enjoyed the variety of the monsters that they have. They have a uh, Boris who, you know, like his hand opens up. So I had to go in there and rig each piece to move, you know, and articulate uh, in like kind of the right way. And, and again, like just a lot of fun doing that. So. Well, as a filmmaker myself, I know how difficult animation is. <laughs> and so I truly appreciate the effort that Pixar and other companies put in that you, you've worked on. People don't realize how many hours of work go into just animating a couple of seconds of film, especially um, like Pixar films. They're getting to the point where landscapes are becoming so realistic. It's almost interchangeable. Yeah. Um, the good dinosaur is, is a good example where the landscape and the water flow looked like a photograph. It didn't yeah. look like it was done in computer. Uh, Ryan, the last dragon had amazing landscapes that looked totally re- re- realistic. It's uh-huh. like the old skin is kind of the only thing they haven't gotten to yet. Uh-huh. But that, that, that's, that's going to come soon enough, I'm sure, where a film made in a computer by animators like yourself is going to look exactly the same as a film shot with a, a standard cinema camera. Yeah, I mean, that's... Uh, that's- a super interesting point. So I, I did want to talk about Good Dinosaur. That was my first uh, Pixar film. Uh, that was a really fun film to work on. I, I did the snake and there was like a Debbie the bird. Um, but it was like, it was my first um, uh, Pixar film. And it was just the, the dedication that they had to the quality level was really impressive. Like just, you know, you were talking about time and just the amount of like uh, effort, you know, the research that goes into every single character that gets created was just really like for me inspiring. And again, like really helped me to grow Another example is cars. Like I learned so much about cars working on cars three, like just the level of detail, just everything, like how the doors are crafted, like the windows, just everything. Like, and they take all of that into consideration when we're, when we're creating all the cars and the way they move and stuff like that. And so, yeah, I, um, I definitely, all this stuff takes time. And the thing is a lot of this, you might not notice it outright, but you'll feel it. If something is wrong, then you'll feel it. And so that's, what's really important. Uh, with the realistic humans, yeah, definitely like the visual effects. I think one of the biggest challenges is right now they can get the shaders to look really good, but when they, once they start moving, you can tell it's not real. Uh, and so that's like the you know the uncanny valley comes into play. And so that's the really tricky part is how do you get them to look realistic even when they're moving? Because there's so much subtlety into the motion. Like even when I open my jaw, like here, like it actually affects all the way up to my temp- temple and forehead, and like you know really subtle things that you have to create. But you have to also do it in a way where it's not too exaggerated. So it's finding that balance. So again, you have a completely different approach if you're doing like a visual effects movie versus an anima- animated film. Because animated films, you want them to look more cartoony. So almost like, you know, not too human. Whereas the live action ones are more subdued and stuff like that. So, Okay. So like many people... Early on, you got into video games and you loved games and you thought it would be so cool if I could work in video games and film at some point in life. A lot of people have that dream. Very few people do it. You did. How did you end up in the industry to be able to work in video games and film and be able to write write all these books? Yeah, thank you. Um, Yeah, no, I definitely, it was like, I still remember as a kid, people asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up. Uh, and like, I know, I remember other people were saying like, you know, astronaut, doctor, lawyer. And I was like, I want to work in video games. And everyone thought I was joking. Right. But I was like, no, I'm serious. Right. Um, and so like, for me, like the big thing was just um, being passionate about video games, but also trying to understand them on a deeper level. Uh, so I know that sounds kind of funny, but like, just from a game mechanic perspective, like what is different? Like, and so I remember, so my first game job was at LucasArts and I remember some of the questions that they asked me, like, what are some of the games I was passionate about? 
uh, what are some of the games I wasn't as passionate about from LucasArts? And so I, uh, I remember I actually answered uh, the Masters of Paris uh, Kasi, and I was, I'm not into that. And they all laughed, and I realized, oh, it's not just me, right? Uh, and so, like little things like that, where you know the game and you know what you're talking about. Um, I think that that was how I got in. Uh, so it, it was a very junior level, but I think uh, I, I worked a lot of hours, and then I also spent a lot of time uh, back then. LucasArts had like a special area where you could kind of train on your own. So I started learning 3D uh, and the artists there were so helpful. Like I am still good friends with many of them. I'm um, actually uh, uh, some of my closest friends to this day are people I met there. Uh, and so we really bonded and just the, the generosity that they had in kind of teaching me and like saying, Hey, you know, uh, we'll bring you up to speed on anything. Like is, if you have questions about anything, um, there was just like this, I think that community and that uh, company just had this really collaborative and open spirit that I, I am still so grateful for. Uh, and so like, for me, like when I look at the Star Wars, you know, franchise as a whole, I have like a different perspective. Uh, so when I go in, it's more like, um, uh, like I feel like this is part of me when I was growing up and it helped me a lot. And so that's, that's the way I approach it. So whenever I go watch a Star Wars film, I'm always just enjoying it. And always, you know, a lot of good memories come back, like going up to Skywalker Ranch, right. And watching, uh, the trailer for Attack of the Clones, right? That was just a cool moment because I actually got there late because I got lost. And then I came in and I saw a bunch of people around me and I was like, oh, who, who is this? And right next to me was George Lucas, right? Uh, so again, like these little random memories that I remember uh, and just have, you know, positive associations with. So that, that's the way I think of the franchise. Um, yeah. Terrific. We have just a couple minutes left. Thank you, Peter, so much for joining us. We have a microphone up here if anyone wants to ask a question. We are talking to Peter Tirius, who is an animator and an author. He's worked with Pixar. He's worked with LucasArts. He's worked on video games and a wide variety of films and has his own book series on mechs. Any, any questions? If not, then, then you, you and I get to just keep, keep chatting. <laughs> Oh, okay, come on up. Which character was your favorite Resident Evil video game? Sorry, could you, could you repeat that? Which character was your Resident Evil character favorite? Um... I, I, you know, when I played the first director's cut, I, I picked it Jill Valentine. Yep, that's what I'm just up as. Okay, you, you got the big thumbs up on that. So, okay. big, big, big thumbs up on I, Jill Valentine. Awesome. Like, I, just about Resident Evil, I was going to say the director's cut. I remember when I first loaded it up, I mean, it was low poly, um, but, like, because it was so low poly, like, my imagination took it way further. And so I remember just being terrified by the game. And so like, I look at it now and I laugh about it, but like back then, uh, and I think it also, because they had the FMV sequences, uh, it made the characters seem more real. So when I saw the low poly you know, polygonal characters, I actually envisioned the FMV characters in there, in the world. And so that was, uh, it was uh, pretty scary for me, so. Did you have follow up? No, okay. She she was just very happy with your answer. So okay, <laughs> yeah. Well, oh, sorry. What, what? Oh, go ahead. Yep. Uh, so we need to wrap up. But okay. Peter, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule. Um, this is a great opportunity to to promote your next project if you can talk about it, and if not, just say I can't mention it. <laughs> I have several projects coming up, but I can't mention them quite yet. But uh, yeah, they'll uh, they'll be coming out soon. So I guess my Twitter would be the best place just to follow me. Um, it's uh, Taraya Shu, just my last name at XU. Uh, yeah, but I, I, there's a couple projects that I'm super excited about. Uh, I wish I could talk about them, but I can't quite yet. But uh, yeah, I just want to say thank you for having me, uh, Kurt, and thank you for everyone who who listened to me uh, drone on for a bit. Uh, I'm really appreciative and. I hope like next year I can actually be there in person. So we would love to see you here. Peter, thank you so much for all the projects that you've done. 
brought so much entertainment to all of us, playing a, a little piece uh, of it. So kudos to the entire Pixar and LucasArts teams and everyone that you've gotten to work with that has provided some entertainment for all of us. Uh, and can keep writing. We look forward to your next project. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Bye.